Coming to you from the top of Tim McLoon's Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. From the top. From the top. Welcome to the Tim McLoon Radio Show, where each week we bring you interesting, creative, and dynamic people from the worlds of entertainment, sports, business, food, and philanthropy. Today's guests are legendary sports writer Phil Pepe and attorney and vice president of Pro Agents, David Pepe. I'm Paul Diomede, and here's your host, Tim McLoon. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone, for being here. At the top of the our... top? We've been fooling around with this for months now. It's a two-story <laughs> building. You make it sound like we're in Times Square coming from the 34th floor. Just reminds floor. me they used to say top of the Empire State Building yeah. in some of those radio shows. Yeah, we shows. are on the second floor. That's, That's about right. the best, most we could afford. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you all for being here, and uh, we do have a really interesting show tonight. Even though I was always a National League, Mets, Mets Dodgers guy. kind of guy, I just got to sort of swallow my pride and... The way the Mets are doing, it's not so good anyway. Uh, and this really isn't a sports show, um, but we love having people from the world of sports because I think it's got a much larger impact on people's lives than just the actual games themselves. So Phil is just one of the all-time great writers, and we're pleased to have him here. I hope he's happy to be here. You never yeah. know. He got a meal out of it. That's all I know for sure. <laughs> we're happy to have him back. He was here with Howie Rose, but Howie did most of the talking. Yes, so. he did. And Howie doesn't have much to say right now with the Mets, so we're <laughs> glad to have Phil back. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, we, we discuss a lot of topics in our opening and over the last few months. And, and you can't help but talk about what's going on in Oklahoma and with the storms. And certainly from where we are right here in the Jersey Shore, trying to put everything back together. And, and I have to tell all the people listening, the people here in the audience, it's amazing seeing how the towns are really racing to get to this weekend. Because You know, it's funny how in the rest of the world, there's, they don't have this Memorial Day to Labor Day thing. We have friends in Colorado, they go back to school like August 4th or right, something. Right. They, they <laughs> total, totally not into our calendar that we have here at the Jersey Shore. But, you know, it, it worries me because when the, the storms hit and there was a lot of pushback, well, why is the federal government providing relief for those people? They shouldn't be living there anyway. They know they're in a flood zone. Why don't they get that out? So I think we need all the people in the Jersey Shore need to move. All the people in Oklahoma and the whole Tornado <laughs> Alley, they've all got to go somewhere. You certainly can't live in San Francisco. That's There's going to be an earthquake. And matter of fact, all of California, they've all got to move too. Sure. I'm not exactly sure where we're supposed to go. Louisiana, forget Louisiana. <laughs> you know, and Florida has more hurricanes than anybody. And of course, it was great today, as they do every year. The hurricane predictors, mm -hmm. oh, this looks like an above-average hurricane year. Thanks for chipping in. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they say that every year. Every year. I have never Ever heard that? In you know, we don't expect a whole lot of hurricanes no, this it's year. Be nice. It's really we're going to take the summer <laughs> off. Um, but at any rate, I, I think what happens. We've talked about this before. If my father were here, he'd say, "No, you've spoken about that before. I talked go. about it." But uh, that when we hear things, it makes us think it's going to happen to us because we cannot grasp the enormity of the planet, the fact that there are 330 whatever million people living here. We can't do it. I was in a, a friend of mine who I graduated from college with. Um, is really wealthy, <laughs> and he has an airplane. <laughs> so we were flying over the Midwest, you know, and you go forever without seeing anything. Right. And we're all back here thinking, boy, you know, if anybody keeps having babies, there's going to be no place to live. <laughs> it's huge. And I used to worry about oil. When they'd say we were using X number of million barrels a day, I think, man, we, we probably only have like three months of that stuff left. <laughs> so it's hard to imagine, but, you know, I, I've talked with my wife about this, that when any mother in the country, not to say the fathers don't care, but particularly the moms, when they hear that a child has been kidnapped, they immediately think, you know, we better not go to the mall tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, and sadly, in most cases, those kidnappings are actually with people they know and it's family disputes, but whatever. You think it's going to happen to you. A plane crashes and you're nervous getting into a plane, even though there are something like 13,000 commercial flights every day in the United States. Mm -hmm. And yet you just think it's going to happen to you. We can't help ourselves. <laughs> and then it goes back to the thing we talked about last week about the media. The 24-hour news cycle. That yeah. now nightly news on any of the networks has to give you 30 minutes of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. just as they did 30 minutes of up in Connecticut and whatever the... the the most recent problem is even 30 minutes of Mike Rice, you know. It was just unfortunate that they now, to keep you from turning the channel, need to give you that's the story that's going on. It doesn't matter what else is happening. But uh, at any rate, it brings me to something else, which is the, the song I'm going to do tonight. Um, it's funny how this works. I've been trying to think of songs to do that are 
kind of meaningful to me and that I think people would enjoy. We'd like to think that. We and hope. today <laughs> I was working on one by Warren Zevon. And for those, most people know Warren Zevon for writing Werewolves of London. Or Lawyers, Guns, is, and Money is the other one. Yeah, you know, uh, ooh, Werewolves of London. <laughs> and, but he was a very thoughtful man who, who died very young. I think he died in 2003, I'm not sure, of lung cancer, mm -hmm. a, a very rare form of lung cancer. And when he knew he was... Uh, going to pass, they gave him only just a couple of months, and he assembled this amazing group of musicians to put out a last Final album. album yeah. And the song I'm going to do here uh, this afternoon was on that album. But it became more personal later on. Um, I, I'd never even heard this song. I was not aware of it. I heard a couple of songs off the album. It was real nice. Warren's even. That's a sad thing, you know. So, uh, a couple of years later, a woman named Joan Dancy, who we've mentioned on this air before, mm -hmm. and I love bringing up Joan's name, she had Lou Gehrig's disease, which is just the worst. And uh, interesting, we have Phil Pepe, who is so connected with the Yankees, too, on with us this evening. But um, it's one of those death penalty illnesses, and it's a particularly harsh one because you just lose muscular function mm -hmm. as you go. And so it's, you just deteriorate, and there's nothing to turn it around. And Joan was a very thoughtful woman. And uh, so it's a two-part story. She decided she was going to put together her own memorial service, which you know some people do if they're, in a sense, fortunate enough and lucid enough to do something like that in their later days. So there was a meeting at our restaurant, our former restaurant up in Seabright, the Rum Runner, with a whole bunch of musicians there. And it was put together by Terry McGovern, who was Bruce Springsteen's manager. manager right. And he was, Joan was his fiancée. And so he says, well, so here are your assignments. And he says to me, this is the Warren Zevon song you're going to do. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know that song. And he goes, well, you, you have to learn it. So I'm like, okay. So it's called Keep Me in Your Heart for a While. And then he gives me the knockout punch. He said, well, this is the one Warren wrote for his family so that they would remember him. I'm like, I cry at everything. <laughs> Come on. Uh oh, are we going to get through this song? But it also, well, I don't know. <laughs> but it also didn't sound like something I would do because he was kind of a, a country folk rock and roller, almost like a better version vocally of Bob Dylan, but that same kind of thing. And I was like, that doesn't sound like me at all. Well, it ends up, I learned the song, and it was as if I were born to do it. It felt so natural to me to do the song. And sadly, so here's the second half of the story. As we've talked about before, my son, uh, Jack, unfortunately contracted uh, leukemia when he was nine, and that's not why I bring this up. We try not to talk about that too much. But Terry McGovern decided that he was going to kind of adopt Jack. And Terry's out on the road with Bruce all the time, and they get these uh, bootleg movies. Mm. Not to give away any secrets, <laughs> Bruce is getting bootleg movies. But Terry, you know, if Terry we was. hear about our lives, that if you do good works and it's like visiting the sick, <laughs> that I don't know how anybody listening to this feels about the hereafter and life after death and what their religious convictions are. But I'm thinking if there's any truth to that, Terry McGovern's in a good place right now. <laughs> because Terry McGovern spent the last day of his life watching a bootleg movie with my son, who was 10 <laughs> years old at the time. He was at our house. He dropped in. I got a movie, Jack. And I don't know what it was, G.I. Joe or something. And he pops it in. The two of them sit there, and they watch the whole movie. And when Terry went to leave, he got up from the couch, and he, would, didn't, he sat back down. And I said, what's the matter? He said, oh, my blood pressure is all out of control. I don't know what's going on. And he left, and he passed away that night. You know, And I thought, well, there's a guy who spent his last day with a sick boy and uh, so I played that song also at his funeral it was uh, and they were unfortunately very close together but uh, so here it is it's called keep me in your heart and uh, if you listen closely to the lyrics one of the problems Warren Zevon had at the end was he was literally having trouble that's why he actually went for uh, to see a doctor he was having trouble breathing mm -hmm. he just couldn't get a lot of breath and if you if you should get this recording uh, by him, and uh, it, it's a beautiful song, but even in his singing of it, he struggles a little bit. Shadows are falling, and I'm running out of breath. Keep me in your heart for a while. If I leave you, it doesn't mean I loved you any less. Keep me in your heart for a while. When you get up in the morning and you see that crazy sun, 
keep me in your heart for a while. There's a train that's leaving nightly, called when all is said and done. Keep me in your heart for a while. Sometimes when you're doing simple things around the house, maybe you'll think of me and smile. You know I'm tied to you like the buttons on your blouse. Keep me in your heart for a while. Hold me in your thoughts. Take me to your dreams. Touch me as I fall into view. When the winter comes, keep those fires lit and I will be right next to you. Engine drivers heading north to Pleasant Stream, keep me in your heart for a while. These wheels keep turning, but I'm running out of steam. Keep me in your heart for a while. Keep me in your heart for a while keep me in your heart for a while broadcasting from Tim McLoon Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Listen to us every Saturday at 5 p.m. on WOR 710 a.m. Follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Tim McLoon Radio and listen to this show as well as past shows on our website, TimMcLoonRadioShow.com. You're listening to the Tim McLoon Radio Show. Up next, legendary sports writer Phil Pepe. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the Tim McLoon Radio Show from Tim McLoon Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And now, here's your host, Tim McLoon. Well, thanks again. Thank you. How's everything going, Paul? <laughs> All right. Um, before we get to our guest, I do want to tell people that uh, my fabulous band, Tim, <laughs> the, Tim Shirley's? And the Shirley's, are going to be doing the best of the Shirley's here. On, it'll be a very short show. It's, it's three songs. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be doing the best of the Shirley's here at the Supper Club on June 1st. Uh, so we hope we'll see people come out to that. But That'll we're also fun. really proud to announce the debut of Club Piscopo. That's right. And there's only one Piscopo in our life, and that's Joe Piscopo. And he's going to be here at our Supper Club. And he's going to have his launch party and first show here on Thursday, June 6th. So you come to see the Shirley's on the first, mm -hmm. take a few days off, come back <laughs> on this. <laughs> we have cots available, though. <laughs> um, and he, they're going to be here doing Club Piscopo, which I think is going to be fantastic. Obviously, comedy, but it's going to be a, sort of an old-fashioned variety show. So they're going to be here the second Wednesday of, of every, month? Uh, every month. But just to confuse everyone, he's going to be here on Thursday, June 6th. All right, that'll be fun. And we'll just see. People come here on Wednesday, they'll leave, and then we'll do the show on Thursday. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can reach us by just going to mcloons.com, and that's M-C-L-O-O-N-E-S.com. I would beg my father to this day to have put the second C in it. Because everyone does. Because everyone does, except yeah. us. But it's There's awards hanging in the office where it's spelled <laughs> wrong, actually. Yeah, to our distinguished guest, <laughs> Tim McLoon, <laughs> spelled wrong. But that's a, at any rate, and uh, one of my favorite performers who was our guest last week, Gary U.S. Bonds, will be here in the Supper Club on uh, Friday, June 14th. Phil Pepe, you play an instrument by any chance? Because we could put you on one of the shows. I wish. <laughs> no? We're excited that Phil my Pepe dad tried to teach me how to play the saxophone. I couldn't. I'd rather go out and play baseball. Yeah, well, I'm <laughs> glad. Um, so what, what got you? Uh, well, let me tell people about you first. Uh, on the off chance someone who doesn't know the name Phil Pepe. Um, you know, you covered New York sports. I was shocked actually to hear five decades. It just shows how old I am. It's got nothing to do with you because <laughs> I remember every one of them. And you were the Yankee beat writer with the World Telegram and Sun, RIP, oh, wow. 1961 to 64. But where people really got to meet you in larger numbers with your time with the New York Daily News from 71 to 84. But also said you've written 48 books. I don't think I've read 48 <laughs> books, but uh, including your one with Mickey Mantle. 
called his favorite summer. I believe 1956 went to number seven in the New York Times bestseller list. But at any rate, our guest Phil Pepe. Thanks so much for being here, Phil. Pleasure Thanks, to be Phil. here. Yeah. And that's all we have time for because I did that song. <laughs> but really, buy his book and good night, everybody. Uh, so, Phil, were you, when you were a kid, I, my son's in a creative writing class in high school. Can you imagine something like that, having a creative writing class in high school? Not, when, but, I, when I went to school. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking not, you know. But were you always interested in writing? I mean, Well, I grew up in Brooklyn, so immediately uh, you have to understand if you grow up in Brooklyn you become a Dodger fan and I would be, I fell in love with baseball about, probably about the age of five uh, followed the Dodgers as much as I could read Bobber on the radio um, and I began to think well it would be nice to be able to write about this game but I thought I could play the game and I thought I would wind up being the successor to Pee Wee Reese as the Dodger shortstop <laughs> how'd that work out uh, it didn't quite make it yeah. <laughs> but uh, the turning point in my life was when I was 12 years old and I was uh, in uh, junior high school, eighth grade, and I wrote a composition about Abraham Lincoln, which the teacher refused to accept because she thought that I had help doing it. Wow. So I went home and I cried to my mother and said, Mom, she wouldn't take... She, my mother, who was not educated but very wise, said, well, you ought to take that as a compliment because what she's telling sure. you is it's pretty good. So now my brain started thinking, well, if I can write a little bit and I love baseball, maybe I can work it out and do the two things together. Oh. And that's so tell me about your parents. I'm always curious when I meet people who've had great success in any venture to hear what their parents were like. Well, my dad was a, an accountant, but he was also a, uh, a musician who worked local uh, uh, dances, weddings, and it was very important. I was not your dad. <laughs> <laughs> And it was very important for him to earn the additional money. You know, he was raising, at the time, uh, we were four kids. Yeah. And uh, I used to go with him uh, uh, when they, he'd play at dances and be the band boy. <laughs> and I kind of got my interest in music from him. I never liked the music of my generation. I always liked his music better. And he introduced me to people like my first hero was Jimmy Dorsey. So he was playing swing and... Yeah, yeah, yeah big band, big band stuff. stuff. What did he play? Saxophone. Oh, he did? Yeah. He, I don't know if you know the name Freddie Martin. I don't. Okay, he was a saxophone. He doesn't know me either, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> Freddie Martin was a big band, uh, band leader whose uh, boy vocalist was Merv Griffin. Wow. <laughs> and he used to play very sweet kind of saxophone, and my father played a lot like him. If you know, that, if you know Freddie Martin, that's how my father sounded. However, so I got my interest in music through him, and I started following First, it was Jimmy Dorsey, and then I, wow. I switched to Be Benny Carter. Then I discovered uh, Charlie Parker, and I'm a big jazz buff. Wow. Who knew this stuff? So how about your mom? My mom was just a homemaker. Both my parents were born in this country. Their parents came from Italy, but they were both born in this country, and she was just a homemaker and a lovely woman uh, who I miss dearly still to this day. Yeah. You know, it's interesting about that. We talked about it last week when I went to see 42, the Jackie Robinson story. I, I miss my dad so much, you know. And I think it's always with us, that thing. You never, you never stop oh, missing them. absolutely. You know, I, I'm, I was speaking with one of the – I coach track locally, and I was uh, speaking to a, someone today about uh, kids and how, how can it be that somebody could be there in a hospital, let's say, holding this newborn child. How can that be – and then 16 years later, they're, they're cursing at each other. <laughs> it amazes me that, that that gap can take place. I was very fortunate in my life. I don't know if you ever met my dad, but he, he ran racetracks. And, uh, I knew of him, but And no. uh, people would say to me, are you Joe McClune's son? And I'd say, yeah. I said, your dad's a great guy. I heard that all my life. I mean, how lucky was I to have that? And my mom was even better, but uh, that's another <laughs> show for another day. So, but you here so you are, a Dodger fan, though. Yeah, what, so where did you go wrong? Time. What happened? I don't know. Well, <laughs> well they I, moved. They left. The they left. Them. They abandoned me. I didn't abandon <laughs> yeah. them. I'm yeah. still a Dodger fan, Brooklyn Dodger. Yeah. <laughs> well, may I tell you the story? Because yeah. you mentioned uh, 42, which I thought was wonderful. And I thought that uh, Harrison Ford was magnificent. I knew... Branch Ricky, Branch Ricky, a yeah. little bit. I didn't know him well, but I was in his company. And what, what struck me about the performance of uh, Harrison Ford was he had the gestures down perfectly. Really? Branch Ricky loved to have a cigar in his, in his hand. Wasn't, didn't always light it, but he, he would gesture with the cigar. And yeah. 
he picked that up wonderfully. But the story I want to tell you is that not many people know this. I was the one who told Jackie Robinson that Branch Rickey died. Really? Uh, and the way that came about, and I didn't know Jackie Robinson as a player. He was retired long before I got into the business. But after he retired, Governor Rockefeller made him a member of the New York State Athletic Commission. I remember that, yeah. And as, as a result, part of his job was to go to boxing matches at Madison Square Garden, and I was covering boxing in those days. And we would go to these luncheons where they would go to promote a fight at the garden. And one day I find myself sitting at a table with Jackie Robinson, a, a, a commissioner of the New York State wow. Athletic Commission. So we, we talked for a little bit. He was very cordial, very helpful. And when we said goodbye, he said, if I can ever help you in any way on this subject, give me a call. And he gave me his home phone number. Well, I never expected to be able to use it, but lo and behold, I'm in my office at the World Telegram one night, and the Associated Press moves a story that Branch Rickey passed away. Mm. And now I have to write about Branch Rickey dying, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, Jackie yeah. Robinson. So I picked up the phone, and I called him in Stamford, Connecticut. He answered the phone. Apparently, I woke him up. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I gave him my apologies for disturbing him. I said, but I really need to talk to you because I have to write this story. Branch Rickey passed away. And the next words I heard him say were, Ray, which is his wife, Rachel, Ray, take the phone for a minute. I want to collect my thoughts. Mr. Ricky just passed away. Oh. And then he got on and he talked and I got my story. Wow. Well, people should see that movie. Oh, and, wonderful. And I love you telling us that movie. story too. So it, it must have been interesting though when you finally became a Yankee beat writer. Was, because things are different now, I, I would assume that there's a lot more personal things that you find about these players, a lot more than you'd really want to know, I'd have to say. What was your take when you took over as a beat Well, writer? the first day that I trapped, I made a trip with the Yankees to Cleveland. When I first, I did, wasn't on the beat, but I was just filling in for somebody. And the first day I was on the road with the Yankees, I'm standing in the lobby of the hotel waiting for the game to start that night, just killing time. And somebody comes over and taps me on the shoulder and says, what are you doing, kid? <laughs> and I said, nothing, I'm waiting for the game. He said, take a walk with me. I got to go buy my wife a birthday present. It was Yogi Berra. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm telling you, I hated Yogi Berra as a Dodger fan. He killed us. Yeah. But how do you hate Yogi Berra? Nobody hates Yogi Berra. Everybody likes Sara Lee and Yogi Berra. <laughs> and, and so I went, and he bought a negligee for his wife. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> That's a horrible thought. <laughs> and I had to call home immediately. I was like, guess who I went shopping with? <laughs> so I have a funny thing with Yogi Berra. My band was playing a party, and he was a guest at it. And we were doing that song, The Name Game, you know, Shirley, Shirley, Fofo, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we did it with Yogi Berra. <laughs> Yogi, Yogi, Fofo, and he did the last bit. He did Yogi. <laughs> it's probably the highlight of my musical career, actually. But uh, <laughs> well, you, a wonderful guy, Yogi. Well, you know what's interesting is uh, now you write that book with Mick. Of course, I guess the first thing we'd say is when you were covering them for the world. Telegram, it was at the end of the golden era for the Yankees, at least that group of people. Well, I, no, I started in 1961. Right, but I'm saying that that was, the, you know, it was all it was, it was all it, great at that point, but it was right. about to it come to an end. was the beginning of the end. Because right. they were aging. Don't ever correct me again, Phil, on the air, please. This is my show. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I don't have my dates right. <laughs> what else have, What else is new? But I had an interesting thing w with Mickey because um, he was working for the head company, the ski people. And we were at a, a Holiday Inn, and I was I had a, a, a athletic store, the running store, still have it. And we went there, and we looking at their clothing. They were getting into the running business. And the guy says to me at the end, he says, hey, you want to meet Mickey Mantle? I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. I said, sure, why wouldn't you say it? He knocks on a door. We're in a suite, and out comes Mickey Mantle to say hello. And I, I found it to be one of the – first of all, he couldn't have been nicer. He was delightful. And then it's like he says hello to you for a minute or two, and then he goes back into the suite that he's staying in. And I was thinking that was one of the saddest things I ever saw in my life. Just not that he's not well paid and all this, but he is playing the role of Mickey Mantle. You know, and I, I'm sure you were very close this to him. This was after he retired? Yeah. Yeah. I just thought that. And no, no, wonder no you, know, you don't get really close to him, but, but for a period of time when we were working on the book. And we're speaking with Phil Pepe, by the way, legendary sports writer. 
Yeah, just that period of time where we were working on the book, and I was helping him earn some money. He was very, cool, yeah. very nice and cordial and friendly, and and it was a, an interesting experience. I I went through my times with him when he was a player, where uh, I wasn't too crazy about him. He was rude. He was crude, but I got to know him after he retired. He became a different person. He matured and. He he appreciated the attention then that he disliked when he was playing. Yeah, I, I, it had to be very difficult to be I'm Mickey sure. Mantle, just as it is difficult to be other. You know, fa- you know, Justin Bieber's having a tough time right now. Not <laughs> to compare the two, but he was the Mick, and I, I just thought it was an amazing thing that that was his job at the time. To, and you know, he was probably about uh, 15 years out of ball by then. You know, he's a mm. little bit older before he got his restaurant and all that in New York. But at any rate, were you, what I was getting at before, when you were with the Daily News and it was really going and you were as, as hot a sports writer as this town has ever seen, was there any pressure on you to not be critical? You're the Yankee beat writer. When, you would, when you'd uh, point out their shortcomings, were you, get, were you no, hearing I it from the Yankees or from the Daily well, News? I was fortunate they didn't have many shortcomings the years <laughs> I was covering them. And, and now as, you weren't covering the Mets. Yeah, exactly. And, and as a a beat writer, I wasn't expected to editorialize. I was just expected to cover the game. Well, but I, you get involved in a lot of the inside petty battles between Reggie and Thurman, yeah. Billy and Reggie, Reggie and George, George and Billy. I didn't really like that. I preferred to just write about the games. What you, you're forced to do those other things as well. I, I was fortunate because when I went to the Daily News, they put me on the Yankees. They won. I covered boxing. Muhammad Ali was the yeah. heavyweight champion. I went to cover the Knicks briefly. They won a championship. <laughs> so I, those are easy assignments. Tim wants you to cover the Mets next. Yeah, I, I, no, just cover me. <laughs> You're apparently good luck with all this stuff. So were there players that you got close to over the years that you thought were just really terrific guys? I hate asking about the bad people. I really do. No, the players that I liked people. and still like, although I, I made it a point not to try to socialize with them because no. I, I, you, there is a kind of an adversarial relationship. But they, I made some pretty good friends. And uh, people ask me who was my favorite. Well, one of my favorite people to cover who's still around in this area is Sparky Lyle. I love being oh, around yeah. him. Mm-hmm. He was funny. He was, didn't take himself seriously. He was a good relief pitcher, but if he lost a game, he was the same guy, win or lose. He was just a, a wonderful guy, and he still is. He just recently uh, moved upstairs. He's no longer is the manager of the Somerset Patriots, but he's been doing that for about 14 years. And, I, and Sparky's got a special place in my heart. Well, as someone who disliked the Yankees from the moment I was born, clearly, <laughs> my, fa- <laughs> my father was a Flatbush Avenue guy. And we talked about it just last week after seeing 42. My first game was at Ebbets Field in 53, and I was five years old, and I know who pitched, and it was Don Newcomb, Robin Roberts. I mean, pretty wow. cool. And what I remembered the most was that the Philly, this is typical of what a five-year-old would remember, the Phillies' uniform numbers were extraordinarily long. I don't know <laughs> if you remember that, but they had really long numbers. I don't know why that was. But I have the, the sad part for me as a baseball fan is I have no recollection of who won the game. Mm-hmm. I was so overwhelmed by the experience and just being out with my dad, just the two of us, because my brother was very ill at the time, and my father felt that I'd been neglected, so he takes the little one out there. What year I, was it? 53. And it was, uh, I'll look it up for you, and I'll get you a copy of it. Oh, the God. Game. I can look it up. <laughs> and then you're going to end up saying neither of them was in the game that day. <laughs> you weren't even there, Tim. You made up the entire thing. And, and he took me to Gil Hodges Day because Gil was our guy in our household, you know, number 14. Yep. And I, I thought it was just an amazing thing when the Mets come around and Gil's the first baseman for the Mets. I just thought this was the best. Little did I know that he had about 80 games left in him. But he became the manager. Know, do you know how he got injured? He, he ended his career because he had his, they were down in spring training taking a long bus trip and he put his legs over the seat in front of him and he pulled a hamstring and that was the end of it. <laughs> He hurt his legs on the bus trip. So I think that's a sign if you're an athlete. When you start getting injured like that, it's time to let it go. Time to retire. One time, we were, I got injured when I was still a competitive runner, if I was ever a competitive runner. And I was building the deck furniture at the Rum Runner. And I pulled a calf muscle building deck furniture. You can't tell people things like that. <laughs> I was crouched over all day, and I pulled a calf muscle. It's like, let's keep this to ourselves. And by saying it on my radio show, I'm still keeping it to myself. So it's okay. <laughs> no one's going to care. So tell me about what keeps you going these days with all the writing you do. What keeps me going is I try to do a book a year, and my biggest 
uh, joy is watching my grandson play college baseball. Oh, where is he playing? At Pace University. Good for him. Finishing up his junior year, and he's got one more year to go. I don't know what I'm going to do the year after next year. <laughs> I think you should start coaching Little League. <laughs> I coach well, my son and I, who you'll meet later, is we coach an American Legion team during the oh, summer. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, you have to do stuff like that. You know, it's funny. When I was a kid, they wouldn't let the parents coach their own children. And uh, I went, played little. I was, I was so bad. I think it's a good idea. By I the way. was <laughs> such a bad baseball player, and I was playing second base. With, and uh, my dad wasn't allowed to coach me, but they had enough parent volunteers. They always had more than enough, as a matter of fact. And now it's if you don't let me coach my son, I'm not coaching, because mm -hmm. they want to be with their child. Which I, you have to wonder about that dynamic. I think we were safer having other people's parents coaching us. What yeah. have you got there? Uh, just happen to have a book? What's that book I called? just happen to have a book. <laughs> Core Four, The Heart and Soul of the Yankee Dynasty by Phil Pepe. Well, we're going to be back with Phil and his son in a few moments. Yeah, we'll talk about the Core Four and some other things. For those of you who just joined us, you're listening to the Tim McLoon Radio Show from Tim McLoon Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. We will be right back after this. Welcome back. You're listening to the Tim McLoon Radio Show on WOR 710 AM from Tim McLoon Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And now, here's your host, Tim McLoon. Well, thanks very much, Paul. And we're here with Phil Pepe, and we've been joined by someone else. We, you know, we believe in this. We just do generation shows here. <laughs> well, it's close and, to Father's Day, so it's exactly. Day Thank show. you for that help. Yes. <laughs> with that. But David Pepe is also here with us. Hey, David, thanks Hi. for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks you ever heard me. any of your dad's stories before? Oh, yeah. This is all new to you, right? Oh, we just, yeah, all, oh, yeah. We just drove up to New Hampshire and, and, and back over the weekend, so I heard about 30 or 40 stories on the way up and on the way back. <laughs> now, you were, I, I read your bio, and you were a wrestler at Rutgers. I was. I could yeah. never figure that one out. I think that is the... <laughs> yeah, Rutgers fans in our audience. No, that was for yep. wrestling. I lost a lot, but I did wrestle there. <laughs> I think wrestling is arguably the most difficult of all sports. Yeah, I it, really it do. Is. It it's is. grim. Yep. I mean, we used to, and oh my yeah. God, I don't know how you guys do it. And in those days, they, we used to lose a lot of weight. I wrestled 126 in college. It was, I'm, I'm not, not there saying now. So. About <laughs> what, yeah. We're on radio, so it's good. You don't, you don't have to pound more than 129 right. here. Right and I have a fabulous head of hair, by the way, in case no one has noticed that. <laughs> but then you went to Seton Hall Law School. Correct. And I've been yep. a Seton Hall guy. I went to Seton Hall Prep, and I announced their basketball oh. games still, so I've kept my contact with the Pirates. Six degrees of Tim McClune. Yeah. <laughs> the name of the show. But what I couldn't understand, it says in your thing, you started the Seton Hall Sports Law Journal. Yeah, yeah. when I was... Uh, what the heck is that? When I was... Uh, sounds to me like you weren't going to class. That's what it Not too like. much. No, <laughs> no when, I, when every law school has a, a law review. Uh, right. a law review journal that, that they would write and there was a professor there that wanted to start a sports law he ran a sports he, he ran a sports law department he had a sports law class that I took a couple of courses in and uh, he wanted to sport, start a sports law journal where you just you know uh, write about case law based on you know athletics any co collective bargaining isn't that uh, amazing yeah it was neat to see it's the it growth neat. of the sports themselves that it would even make something like that you know sure. necessary in a sense yep so, but you're an agent now, correct? I am. Yes, sir. Anybody yeah. you want to tell us that you represent? Uh, my biggest client is Joe Nathan, who's a closer for the Texas Rangers. Sure. And uh, Joe's been, I've been with Joe for 15 years, and he's a good person, and we've had a lot of, a lot of fun together and a lot of success together. And then there's Jay-Z. What's up with that? I don't, I don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about that, right? <laughs> Go figure. So what would you say has changed in the relationship between the teams and their players in the time you've been representing athletes? Um, you know, it... I got into the business, you know, I'm in the business about 18 years now, uh, and it was at the ending of the, the wane, I should say, of the, the old school baseball guys and at the beginning of the sabermetricians and the, the real statistical analysis. Yeah. That's been the biggest change. There like are money ball. Money ball, yeah. And, and, the, and the, you know, you, you have general managers who never played, who never scouted, who are really just – number crunchers and yeah. that's that's a big difference not that they're bad and not that they're wrong but I got into the business really 
valuing scouts and scouting ability and, and putting your eyes on a player and, and, and using your, your, you know, your intuitive part. And I don't discount the data. I do yeah. use a lot of it, and, and there is some merit to it. But that's the biggest change for me. I actually think Moneyball is one of those movies that's prowling around late at night on Encore or Excellent. something. you got to watch I it. I watch it all you gotta the time. you got to watch it. Yeah, yeah. It re- I mean, I saw it in the theater. I thought it was terrific, but there's something compelling about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe part of it's Brad Pitt. I thought he was great in he that He was great. Thing. And I but, know Billy Bean. Uh, you know, I've, we've done deals together, and, yeah. I, and, I, and it's funny. I was in the winter meetings last winter, and I ran into him, and he was in the he, I ran into him in the gym, and he was on the treadmill. So he's what you see in that movie is very close to what he is. I, I was going to ask your dad, Phil Pepe, who is seated to your right there, that uh, about your favorite sports movies. So what do you got, Phil? Well, I, I like Field of Dreams, but it's just it's a fantasy. And I think the, the 42 rates right up there. with it. I like the fact, and you talked about Moneyball, I like the fact that the, the authenticity of it. I mean, they yeah. really captured the way it is and the way it was. And a lot of the old-time movies, like even the great... Pride of the Yankees, you know. He couldn't play. He couldn't Lou play. Lou could play. And yeah. Fear Strikes Out, the Jimmy Pierce yeah. Ulster, that was the worst baseball player And how player about ever. Babe Ruth with uh, William Goodman. Bendix and then John Goodman? Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, the one, my, my baseball movie was The Natural. First of all, I, as I said to you earlier, I love the soundtrack. Randy Newman's soundtrack just to me screams baseball. And, and when I went out, we were talking about it when we were off the air. Um, I went out to Wrigley Field with my family, really, for the first time two years ago. And before the game started, they played the soundtrack from The Natural. Uh, not that I needed it at Wrigley Field. I was already all in on this. But, <laughs> but hearing that music come out there, I thought that was great. I didn't like Field of Dreams that much. Be- I guess because, and you know, part of it was, this is how stupid I am. There are many indications <laughs> of that, but this is only one of them. But <laughs> I didn't like the fact that it kind of had that there are ghosts and stuff, and it's happened in daylight. I don't know. I just I needed more nighttime if I'm going to watch a ghost story. <laughs> the thing about The Natural that got me, though, was I read the book before I saw the movie. Bernard Malamud, I think it was, short story. Yep. And he dies in the end. Yes. And they did sample, I guess, testings with people, and people got so upset yeah. that he dies at the end that they did that kind of weird ending and there's no soundtrack the soundtrack ends and he's having a catch in the field with his son I guess you assume it's his son and you don't know if it's the afterlife or now but they said people just didn't want Robert Redford to die in that movie <laughs> but I, I thought it was fantastic and I, what interested me in asking you about the natural was the relationship with that sports writer not that the guy you know he was a seamy underhanded kind of person no <laughs> one would ever say that about you but I thought that was an interesting part of it you know he says I can make or break you kid or something like that and I'll be around long after you're done. While we're on the subject, uh, let, let me not uh, include Eight Men Out, which I, I liked a lot. Yeah, it I just, liked that movie. It, yep. Yeah. Raging Bull as well. People always forget uh, Raging Bull is a sports movie. movie. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> well, that, that may be the greatest sports <laughs> movie yeah. ever. Yeah. Well, so David, uh, you know, everything we're saying, what got us to Moneyball was just the fact that there were these, I, you know, as a kid, I was such a baseball nut. I used to keep score at home, and I, I would just keep all those books and all this sort of stuff. And I got entranced with on-base percentage when I was little because I I just always thought that, you know, if you get a walk, it doesn't count in your batting average. It's almost like it didn't happen. And when we were kids, of course, playing Little League, they yell at you, a walk Walk is is as good as a hit, right? (laughs) But when you become older, the coaches are always saying, be a hitter. And they don't want you taking pitches. And I just think it's kind of interesting. And so I think that was the real crux of Moneyball, both as a book as well as as a movie, was that thought that they had this guy, I think it was the catcher, who was in the minors and he had a crazy on-base percentage because he was walking twice a game. And nobody wanted him because he had a light stick otherwise. He's hitting, you know... Was it Hattenberg? That wasn't Hatterberg. He no, was the Hattenberg. first baseman. Uh, Jerry, it was, Jerry Brown, I think. I, he may not even been a key person in, yeah. in that team. But when they were evaluating him, they were all, oh, he, he just well, walks. They, they he called gets hit Kevin Euclid the Greek god of walks. In that uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea that a walk is as good as a hit. And now it doesn't advance runners and all that sort of stuff. And I used to wonder about that, that why they don't credit people for advancing someone. Not if you hit a, you know, I'm getting too arcane here, but, you know, if you, if you put down a button and a guy gets a base, you want to get yeah. credit for the base. Yeah. And that's what they're doing now. Yeah. So I'm basically saying to you that I invented all of that okay. when I was <laughs> 12 enough. and no one would pay attention to me. <laughs> so is it enjoyable representing athletes? It, it is. It's, it's a lot of travel. It's a lot of late nights, um, uh, a lot of time away from my family. I have three kids and, and my wife, and, but they've been very patient. And, uh, you know, ups and downs. You know, you have you know, Joe Nathan, for example, was a starting pitcher with the San Francisco Giants when he came in, got into the big leagues. And 
had a pretty significant shoulder surgery and was in, in the low level minor leagues, double A, really getting getting smoked, just couldn't couldn't get anybody out for a yeah, year. I remember. And then he kind of resurrected himself, got you know, got stronger and, and his shoulder came back and they put him in a bullpen, his velocity started to climb. So those ups and downs and you have guys with, with real real downs and, and you have to know how to handle them and keep them focused and it's it's been rewarding. Um, you know, I had a client. I have a client who's a setup man for the Minnesota Twins named Jared Burton, who has had a very significant injury history uh, with the Cincinnati Reds, and they non-tendered him essentially last year when he was uh, before last year before he uh, became third-year arbitration eligible and was going to get a, a nice payday. They didn't offer him a contract because he had had such an injury history, and he signed a non-roster minor league contract with the Minnesota Twins. He had a great year last year, knock wood, and signed a two-year deal this, this offseason. And, um, you know, that's a real rewarding There's thing. There's some great stories out there. Oh, the sure. Mets have a relief pitcher who's made his major league debut with 30. Yeah. And, yeah. Scott and Wright, there's yeah. a couple of guys wandering around the league, if I knew it better like I did when I was 12, who you hear these stories about guys yeah. that were literally out of baseball for three years. Neil, Co Neil Kotz uh, got called up yesterday by mm -hmm. the Texas Rangers, left-handed pitcher, hadn't been in the big league since 08. I mean, there's that's some wonderful time. stories there. Yeah. When you, saw, you know, Speaking of movies, the rookie – which was not a great movie, right. but what a great story yeah, true about story. this guy who's a, you know, a yeah. pretty good pitcher and his arm just so, sort of goes dead. He becomes a high school teacher, becomes a high school coach, yeah. and then it makes a deal with the kids. If you win the league championship, I'll try out for a major league team. Yeah. I mean, it was just a great, great story. A true story. Not a, a great, story. great movie, but yeah. <laughs> it was all right. The story is great. The, yeah, we'll just yeah. go with that. Well, you know, it must have been interesting growing up with Phil Pepe in your, you know, it, as it, a kid. I mean, were you totally immersed in sports every minute of your totally life? Totally immersed in sports every minute. Uh, movies. He's a movie buff and and, uh, and music. He kind of introduced us to music. But as a matter of fact, somebody, f I have a brother uh, who's a year younger, and we were he was a football player in college. I wrestled. And he's a big Facebook guy, and so he must have put a picture on Facebook of he and I with Muhammad Ali when we were eight years. I was eight. <laughs> uh, I was nine. He was eight. And I somebody texted to me, and and so I got to meet Muhammad Ali when I was nine years old, and had, wow. and and you know Ron Bloomberg came to our house for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> it's true. It's a true story. The first um, was he first designated here. That's right. Yeah. He was right. right. Ron yeah. Bloomberg. Yeah. And uh, the, he yeah. was one of the reasons they invented. I hate that rule. <laughs> Where are you on the designated <laughs> hitter? Come on, it's been forty years. Yeah. Give it up. I don't. What do you think, Dave? Well, Bill? I, I have mixed emotions about it. I think if it wasn't not for the designated hitter, we wouldn't have known Edgar Martinez, and I think that would have been a, a great. I didn't loss. want to know him. <laughs> As I always say, I wrote for the team that plays in the league with nine players. Mm. We just we just use nine. Right, the other league uses ten. I understand. 10. I accept that. <laughs> The other one I wanted to ask you, because we were you know, talking about relief pitchers, and generally speaking, in history, they do have that kind of on-year, off-year, on-year, off-year. Seem, it seems. That's yeah. been, everyone around here got spoiled by Mariano Rivera because he just had on-year, on-year, on-year. I mean, he is just a, a medical as well as a physical marvel. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, he's, he's but I, I would want to ask him, why is he wearing 42? I just... It makes me crazy. Yeah, uh, you know, luck. Who knows? You know, these they're, they're creatures know, of habit. They, but he's I mean, the only one, right? Well, yeah, he's the only one who refused he's to give up. grandfathered in, right? Yeah. And, and what a great guy. I mean, there's yeah. nothing about him you'd say, oh, that's typical of that guy, that self-serving yeah. thing. But I'm watching the movie at the end. It says, and from that day, it's the only number retired by Major League Baseball. Well, you think he should have just, he could have given it up. Particularly yeah. this year. Yeah. Well, I, I Go had, for 24 or something. I right? had an interesting uh, uh Situation with exactly. I know that he same listens, thing. so <laughs> okay. you know, you'll probably see him change his number a couple of days from now. When Joe Nathan was a free agent and signed with the Texas Rangers, um, they had C.J. Wilson was wearing number thirty-six. Yeah. That's Joe's number. <laughs> so the, uh, we're doing the deal with. I was doing the deal with John Daniels as GM. He's a very, very bright guy, good guy. And uh, he said, "Hey, one other thing. You know, we have. I, we're probably not going to re-sign C.J. Wilson. He was a free agent at the time." Uh, but if we do, he wears number 36. Do you think Joe will care? Do you think Joe will care? I know Joe, you know, for 15 years, I know him very, very well. I'm like, nah, I won't bother him. It'll be fine. <laughs> I called Joe. I said, we got the deal. This is where we're at. And I said, and one other little weird thing, they, they want to know if you care about not wearing 36. He goes, no, I got to wear 36. <laughs> I said, I said, well, they have a guy who's, you know, he goes, well, if he's there, we got to, I, I got to work something out with him because I got to wear 36. 
there's and and that's something yeah. that was out of character. And they do work it out sometimes, though. Yeah, Guys yeah. will hey, actually pay yeah. money. Joe to get was ready number. to buy him a car if he could keep 30 cents. I swear to you. It was a deal breaker. It was oh, a deal breaker wow. for him. Well, David Pepe and Phil Pepe, I, I am so grateful for you being here. We could do hours talking about baseball and but about life in general. Well, let's. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back. Okay. Thanks. We're Thanks take so a much for break. being our guest. You're listening guys. to the Tim McLoon Radio Show from Tim McLoon Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. We will be right back after this. Welcome back to the Tim McLoon Radio Show. That's some interesting music we have there, Tim. You're listening to the Tim McLoon Radio Show, broadcasting from Tim McLoon Supper Club in Asbury Park. We have a special treat for you now. It's going to be Steve the Bartender, who we just dragged out from behind the bar. I'm going to ask him some questions about movies. Here's your host, Tim McLoon. Playing the Star Trek theme. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hi, Tim. This is what happens when you work here. You have to do this show, too. Steve the Bartender. So they, do they use that old Star Trek theme in any of the Star Trek movies? I don't think they do. Yeah, they, it's still a traditional Star Trek theme. Like I said, they still use those, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you tell I haven't seen this? So what's the new one called? Star Trek Into Darkness. Into Darkness. So what would you think? It was good. Let's get right. It was good. There's a ringing there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of mixed reviews about it, but um, it picks up right where the other one left off back in 2009. Now, that was the one where they reintroduced the, the main character's as younger people, right? Yeah. So Spock is like 20 years old or something. Yeah, they're all in their early 20s. They're still supposed to be going to uh, the Starfleet Academy. Like, it's the beginning. It's before the show, before Kirk and Spock had a long history together. It's supposed to be when they're young men. Okay. But it leads up to where now the I show... Now, I heard that one was good. You saw that one? Yeah. Okay, so that was pretty good, right? Yeah, they're, they're both... Uh, so this is good. kind of a sequel to that. I yeah, think, right? this one picks up right where that one left okay, off. You tell me if I'm wrong in any of this stuff. It's okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you said, that, what format did you see? You saw it on IMAX? IMAX. In so New how Brunswick. was that? I mean, is that is it's, it distracting or is it does it enhance the experience? It enhances it. Not yeah. by a crazy amount, but it, it's fun. It's different. It's something you do like a big movie like that where there's a lot of space scenes and action scenes. But uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I'll tell you, when, when I first saw Star Wars in New York City, and I don't recall the theater we were at, but it's one of the legendary ones, but I don't remember a lot of stuff, but that first spaceship is going over your head. It's chasing a smaller one, and you see mm -hmm. the smaller one first, and eh, that's pretty good. And then that thing comes over, and it had to be a theater that seated like 1,500 people, and it just keeps going and going, That and the theater bursts into applause because no one had ever seen anything like that. Do you do you feel now that you know now that it's been thirty years of making sci-fi movies after maybe Star Wars broke the mold? Do you do you think the technology you know, are they just trying to outdo each other? Because I get the sense that you know, as many people would say, that the scripts are just so weak in so many of these things that the it's just all about the special effects. Uh, now, with especially this movie, the Star Trek, the new one, they waited four years to make it. They waited for the right storyline, the right plot. They didn't rush anything. The, uh, it's not all about what you're looking at. It's a good story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're all trying to one-up each other with graphic effect, uh, effects. Um, bigger explosions, bigger ships, louder noises. They're all just trying to be better than each other. It was but really funny because I was saying we were going to go see, I think, G.I. Joe with my son. And I read the review, which was really tepid. And it said... A non-ending string of you know huge explosions, loud noises, and scantily clad women. And I said, I don't think we're going to go to that. And he goes, Which part of that am I not supposed to like? <laughs> yeah. So what do you think of 3D in general? Because it's creeping now into non. I mean, it, it was a thing that you'd see a cartoon or you know a horror movie, but now it's creeping into mainstream movies. What do you think? It's just. Uh, it's really. It's a waste. It just causes headaches. It's five dollars <laughs> more a ticket. And it's really just like four or five scenes per movie that needed to be in 3D. Like one thing might fly past you or one person might do something that shocks you. Most of these movies that they're releasing in 3D are only like 3D for five seconds. Yeah. It's just, it's just another way for them to get a little more money out of you. I liked it down in Disney World and The Little Mermaid, I think, had 3D effects or something like that. And that was pretty good. That's, <laughs> that's different. That's fun. The, uh, the theaters with the glasses, it's really the home 3D is a lot better. That's a lot more fun. Do you have one of those with those no, glasses? My, a friend of mine yeah. has it, but it, uh, that's that's worth that's worth on the money spending. we pay him. Do you think he's got that in his house? <laughs> I mean, he's, 
He talks to me about it every day. What are you talking about here? That's well, it. Steve, the bartender, would you say, should they go see Star Trek? Definitely. Oh, there you go. All right. That's our segment. Steve, Steve the bartender. The bartender. Thanks gentlemen. a lot, Steve. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. We will be right back after this. Welcome back to the Tim McLoon Radio Show, broadcasting to you from Tim McLoon Supper Club in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Thank you, Paul. Well, we had a great show today. I really enjoyed it. I just want to remind people that I'll be here with my band, the Shirley's, uh, on June 1 here at the Supper Club in Asbury right. Park, doing the best of the Shirley's. And we also want to announce the debut of Club Piscopo uh, right here at the Supper Club, Joe Piscopo's new show. And they'll be here on uh, Thursday, June 6th. Gary Bonds, Gary U.S. Bonds, quarter to three. He'll be here Friday, June 14th. Sounds like the same individual is applauding each of those That's announcements. Derek. And, Derek and we want to remind everyone that Phil Pepe's new book is called Core Four. Those aggravating yeah. four Yankees who got 3,000 <laughs> wins among them over the last 15 years. And we hope you'll buy the book Core Four. And I noticed the forward is by David Cohn, which is great. There yeah. you go. All Another right. guy that aggravated me. Right. <laughs> Not as a Met, though. Thank you for tuning in today and sharing this hour with us. Tune in every Saturday afternoon from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. right here on WOR 710 AM and on iHeartRadio. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter at Tim McLoon Radio. The accounts and descriptions of this broadcast are the property of Tim McLoon Broadcasting, the retransmission or rebroadcast of any part of the Tim McLoon Radio Show without the express written consent of McLoon Broadcasting. I'll consent is to anything. Strictly prohibited. In writing. Our show is produced by myself and TME. I'm Paul Diomedi. The con uh, coordinating producer is Virginia Sanderson. The technical director and associate producer is Dana Noto. Our sound engineers are Tony Lasardo and Thomas Bishop. For Tim McLoon, I'm Paul Diomedi, and we will see you next week on the radio.